We don't do that. We, we talk in terms of time sharing. Who has what days, what nights, what weeks, right. what months, whatever it may be. And so dealing with children is totally different than dealing with money. Uh, you know, I always say I can split money. I can't split kids. I can't give you the top half of your son and give give your, your, your husband the Hey everybody, Lee Wright here. I am a divorce coach. Welcome to my channel, Seasons Ebb and Flow for the season of divorce and beyond. Uh, today, I'm really excited. I am going to be interviewing Damon Weiss. He is a divorce attorney here in Orlando, and he was actually my personal divorce attorney, which is how I know him. And I asked him if he would be willing to come on and answer some questions. So we're going to get started. Damon, I'm going to turn it over to you and have you just tell us a little bit about your background and what you do. Thank you. First of all, thank you for the opportunity uh, to speak today and thank you or be interviewed. And also thank you for the opportunity when I got to represent you. Yes. Um, I am the managing partner of the law firm in Maitland, Florida, uh, called uh, Weiss, Gruner and Barnett. And uh, we've been around for a long time. I'm in my 25th year of practice. I'm actually a second generation divorce lawyer. My father uh, practiced, wow. practicing for over 50 years, although the last 19 just in mediation. Um, we have several associates and we practice 90% uh, family law as a law firm in total. Um, okay. That's it for that. Okay, awesome. So what I wanted to start with, because part of my training as a divorce coach was uh, how do we help clients who have attorneys be credible clients so that their attorneys can work with them and move the process faster and uh, close the case or get to the end of the settlement quickly. And from your perspective, what makes a client uh, easy to work with so that you can actually get the case? Hold on, I'm gonna re-ask that. I've, I'm watching two dogs and then I have my own. Let me shut this door. I have multiple gigs, but I have a guy who helps edit this. So just when the dogs bark, okay. So when I was in my training for divorce coaching, uh, they talked about what makes a credible client so that the attorney can work with them and have them close the case and get to the end as quickly as possible so it doesn't drag out. From your perspective, what helps you as an attorney with your clients, like how, what do they do that makes it easier for you to work with them? Well, the first and foremost in, in, in having a, the, a, a better client, I'll say, or what we call an A client in my, in my, in my office, we, we rate them as far as how, how they go and what, what, how they are as far as facilitating uh, the process for themselves as well as for us as a law firm. Mm. And in doing so, the first and foremost to me is information, information gathering, first of all. In other words, if you can come to me, and it's not necessarily in the first meeting, um, but definitely by the second meeting, I want you to bring, I, I, I want my client to, whether they're informed or not financially, if they can get me copies or have copies of any financial documents, preferably. Mm -hmm. Um, if there's children, if there's children's issues and the children aren't doing well, I want to see report cards. I want to see a psychologist report if there is any things of that nature. And then secondly, and probably even more important is the honesty of the client. So mm -hmm. if a client feels that there is, um, so what I call skeletons in the closet, it's better to tell me in the first appointment rather than the, rather than the second, third, or better yet me finding out when we're in front of a judge at a hearing or a trial. That's oh, the worst. Yeah. I mean, I can give you examples, time in the memorial. It's the worst thing that can ever happen. You don't want me to learn something about your case. And while I'm, I think I'm pretty good at it on the fly and can do very well in court, because sadly, after 25 years, uh, it's not one or two clients who have failed to tell me pertinent 
uh, information. But mm -hmm. certainly, if you can tell me in the, in the first consult or uh, in, in, in the second, preferably the first, we can talk about it and, I can, and we can, so, so to speak, put lipstick on the pig, as they say. Right. Okay. That's so interesting. That definitely helps because everyone may have skeletons. Uh, not, not everyone has skeletons, but you know, certainly there's things that, oh, you know what, I wasn't good at this, or I wasn't the best parent when I did that, or you know what, maybe I shouldn't have spent this last week, or you know, give me give me the information ahead of time and we can yeah. talk about it. Maybe right. there's ways to fix it, maybe there's ways to dress it up, maybe there's way, you know. Maybe I want to figure out how to go first in a hearing. Maybe I'm going to file something so that way I get to talk about it first, right? Which, which makes whatever the issue is smaller when they try and when the other side tries to question my client. Those mm -hmm. are things I can try and do, but you've got to let me know when there's something bad that you may or may, may have done. I mean, if it's right. not paying taxes, if it's I beat my kid or while my kid was with me last week, you know, something happened and he broke his finger in a car door, things of that nature. Gotcha. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense that if you are having someone represent you, the way they can best represent you is if they have all the information and use their professional experience to choose how to address it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Hmm. So that's why I say information is the most important. Okay. Gotcha. And also, the sooner I get all the information, the sooner I can guess, you know, people uh, give it, I won't say guess, the sooner I can give information, give advice. So one of the things, as you know, people always want to know what their alimony is going to be. Right. And I, you know, I don't have a crystal ball, but with 25 years experience and a lot of trials, um, I can, I, I have the experience to know what, a, what the, what judges typically in my area, area of practice and area of concentration, in other words, like what counties I practice in. I can sure. give you, I can make recommendations based on the financial information once I have all the financial information. Right. But getting that so, sometimes is difficult. Clients are slow to pull it all together. Right. I'm always very scared when people ask me in my first consult, what do you think I'm going to get for alimony? Or what do you think I'm going to have to pay in alimony? Mm. It's it, it, the first, the first time I meet you, probably not the best time to give you advice. I mean, I can give you guesstimates, but it really is a very wide spectrum that I'm going to give you because I don't have, you might know what your spouse makes and what you make, but we don't know There's all the so expenses many, and yeah. stuff. Right. Things Assets like and yeah. You know, sometimes um, you may have a huge house, you may have a lot of money in a house, but we don't know what the equity is. Mm -hmm. one, invariably, one spouse knows what the mortgage is and the other one doesn't. Or right. if you're going to have a large expense coming up, you know, we have to put on a $80,000 roof on our house or right. You right. Know, things of that nature. Or, you know, I, I had one today where, you know, the biggest question was who's paying, you know, next year's tuition bill for $30,000 for the two kids, yeah. um, you know, that kind of thing. Or what percentage of, is, is mommy going to pay versus daddy going to pay? Right. Those so, are, those are um. When so when you're talking about hearings and uh, litigation, like my divorce, we didn't have, go in front of the court at all. We started with mediation. There were his attorney who was a, a shark attorney. I would classify him as that. I don't know if you remember who it was. I don't need to name him. But and my ex stopped listening to him in mediation pretty quickly because he was like, we're going to court. But we didn't have any hearings, even though he filed some things that were like scare tactics from my perspective. Yeah, I don't get scared by that. But yes, there are motions. Sometimes yes, that motions file. that were like absurd. Um, and you were like, Shh, don't worry, I just have to respond. But but we never had hearings or anything. So when is it that clients have hearings before they even go to mediation? Because I know in Florida, you're required to do mediation before litigation. So locally right now, there are a very limited amount of hearings can be had prior to a mediation. Okay. So things such as a motion for attorney's fees can be heard before yeah. a mediation temporary relief such as temporary alimony right. or things of that nature are not going to be heard until after a mediation. So depending on who I'm representing, I may want to rush to a mediation okay. knowing that it's not going to get very far, but I know at least I can get, get my on hearing so that relief. I can get the relief for my client. Right. right. Okay. So the temporary relief is done in mediation because I was pretty strapped, but I was just using my credit cards leading up to mediation 
And I, I didn't reach out to you and say like, I can't make it to mediation. Cause I was like, I will make it to mediation, but I, cause I would, didn't want to have to go to court for relief. And I wasn't sure what that process was. And I didn't ask too many questions before mediation. So there is mediation for temporary relief. If the mediation is the full mediation needs is probably going to be way far out. Correct. Because also okay. you might be talking about a, a lot of information that needs to be gathered. So yeah. if, if your spouse owns a business yes. it's a, or sh a share of a large business, your spouse may not know the value mm. of, 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 of their share of the business. Right. And there might be records that I need to get from that business. And that's going to take time. Yes. Um, yeah. One of the things like right now, we're at the end of the year in 2022, but I can't get the financial records because you don't, a lot of people don't, they they're not ready for year end numbers. No. It's still two more weeks to go. And then it takes a month or two, at least for their CPAs to put their business numbers together. And right. as a result of that, I can't, I may not be ready for a real hearing anyway for, yeah. for another 90 days. For a while. And if you're, yeah. Um, because when, like for people who don't, haven't gone through a divorce, temporary relief is basically a temporary alimony child support if one was the main breadwinner and they're not providing enough money to make ends meet in order to get to mediation where right. it, can also, final. it can also include I need exclusive use of the house because the two parties aren't getting along. I'm not saying that a court's going to award that either way, but that right. may be an issue or it may a temporary issue may be uh, time sharing as far as I need to go on vacation or I need to go to this business, mm. business conference or things of that nature. Yeah. Uh, who's gonna, are we filing taxes together or separate for this year? Uh, you know, or okay. I need, I need supervised contact because my spouse is addicted to drugs or mm. causes physical harm to the children, things of that nature. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Um, from your perspective, uh, what are the differences between a case that has a lot of issues when it comes to child custody challenges versus the splitting of assets? Uh, how do they differ in like the challenges for the client and for you? Like, do you approach those two situations differently? They're totally different. Money is different than time sharing. We don't, uh, in Florida, we got rid of the word custody uh, yeah. over oh, a decade okay. ago and we call it time sharing. Okay. And no, I'm not trying to teach anything. But, <laughs> no, uh, no, but that's really good for me to know. We use, you know, custody was a is a dirty word. Okay. And so we now use time sharing, and you know, because everybody wanted to be the primary parent back in the day when I started practicing, it was all about the okay. primary parent. <laughs> oh, interesting. Um, and so uh, we don't do that. We we talk in terms of time sharing. Who has what days, what nights, what weeks, right. what month, whatever it may be. And so. Dealing with children is totally different than dealing with money. Uh, you know, I always say I can split money. I can't split kids. I can't give you the top half of your son and give give your 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 husband the bottom half of your uh, of your son. But right. yet, I can take a hundred out of a hundred dollars. I can give you ninety and give him ten, or I can give him ninety and you ten. Yes. So there's different remedies available uh between when, when, when and they're separate not they're, they're they're not they're they're mutually exclusive yeah so one has nothing to do with the other how you approach them is totally different i mean a lot of times in a money case i'm going to bring in a forensic financial expert sometimes who's going to help us talk about your alimony needs or your or your ability to pay alimony or the value mm -hmm. of your business or thing of the value of certain assets things of that nature Whereas right. if we're dealing with children's issues, I might bring in a, a in a licensed mental health counselor or a psychologist. Yeah. And we can deal with it that way. So it's different experts and it's different and it's different remedies. So right. it's different conversations. I mean, conversations you can have at the same time, but uh, but they are mutually exclusive. Yeah. Okay. That's good. Um, when it comes to mediation. What are some recommendations that you give to clients to prepare for mediation? So I tell clients uh, normally ahead of time that if mediation is going to be successful, you are not going to get your best day and you're not going to accept your worst day. Right. At the same time, 
the other side's not going to get their best day and they're not going to accept their worst day. Right. So I tell them, look, the goal is in the beginning to figure out what your highest demand is, what their highest demand is. And at least we didn't have bookends. Now mm-hmm. the question is over, med- over the time of mediation, how close can we get? And hopefully yeah. reach a resolution where you're going to be a little unhappy and your spouse is going to be a little unhappy. Right. That's the best one mediation. And I always say, remember this. When you're, uh, I was taught this by my father, is that at mediation, both of you, when I say both of you, you and your spouse, have a pen. You have the ability to write down whatever agreements you want to come to. Okay. When you go to a court, neither one of you does. The judge has the pen. Yes. The judge can say or do whatever they want. And if you don't like it, you're going to be in for a long ride to the appellate court. It's going to be very expensive. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm so grateful that we finished in mediation pretty quickly. And I think we were both on the same page that we didn't want to make our lawyers rich and have our money disappear. And well, you've been to my office and you've seen pictures of me and my family. And I always say, listen, we live a wonderful life. Thank God. But, you know, how much you choose to fight determines how well we're going to live as a family. Mm-hmm. So I don't wake up in the morning, nor do I make any of my associates wake up in the morning and figure out who we're going to bill and how much. But the, the work leads us that way. But mm-hmm. I always say, listen, I can teach you how not to spend money. It's up to you whether you want to do it or not. Mm-hmm. But, you know, and it's always incongruous. The people who don't have that much always want to spend more. And the people who have the money don't want to spend it. Right. So, it's interesting. You know, I, I think that choosing your attorney is really important because if you choose an attorney who wants to instigate trouble uh, and get you escalated to where all of a sudden you are in war mode, then they're not going to be in your best interest to help end the the divorce. Correct. Correct. Like I, I feel like my ex's attorney wanted us to go to court and he did many things like that motion that were kind of creating an acrimonious uh, environment for us. When we had talked from the get-go of an amicable divorce so that we were amicable co-parents. And I feel like, you know, my ex probably chose an attorney quickly um, and thank God he had the rational mindset to realize his attorney wasn't helping him in mediation and then just worked with our mediator who was wonderful. Um, But had he not, we could have gone down this path of uh, letting his attorney direct us into like a money pit, you know, situation. Um, So there's no question. Uh, You know, I always say, I, I can catch more bees with honey. So yeah. while I'm, I'm a heavy litigator, I try a lot of cases in Central Florida, probably more than most. Okay. I have a large practice in, with, with other lawyers. So um, the percentages might be the same, but I'm still in court a lot. But I can tell people that I don't wake up in the morning and want to get a court. Uh, I want to see if I can resolve it because, as we said, your, your outcome is is controllable in a mediation or even without a mediation. A lot of times, uh, and I'm going to bring this up, a lot of times I'll say, oh, in a consult, I know the, I know your spouse is a lawyer. Yeah. And it's interesting when I say that, the, there's two responses. One is, that's great, it'll be resolved quickly. Mm-hmm. The other response is, whoa, I don't want to hire this person. Oh, they're friendly, they're in cahoots. They, oh, you know, interesting. I, I can tell you, I've never worked with another lawyer on the other side to try and do anything shady or whatever. I mean, just because I'm friendly with somebody, that should prove to be a benefit to you because I can pick up the phone and say, hey, tell your client to stop doing A, B, C, and D. Or right. they can pick up the phone, call me and say, hey, stop doing A, B, C, and D. And then I go to you or you, or they go to your, your spouse and mm-hmm. the problems rectify without motions, without hearings, without a lot of litigation. And right. that's cheaper and better for you guys. I mean, I, yes. on, the way, on the way back from mediation this afternoon, I was on the phone with another lawyer and we were just talking about a case that we have and we've been trying to resolve it. I, I think we, I think we're going to resolve the temporary matters without having the hearing next month. Wow. And yeah. That's going to save both sides thousands. Exactly. And oh, I mean, here's sure. a guy I get along and this is the attorney on the other side, the guy I get along with. Right. Now, he didn't fold for me and I didn't fold for him. Mm-hmm. 
Right. It's a win-win if you are right. both there to try and resolve it for your clients as quickly as possible and peacefully as possible. Correct. I want to say, I'd rather save you money because I don't advertise. And mm-hmm. I don't, I, 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 you know, I think one of the questions we're going to get to later is, is about how to pick a lawyer. Advertising yeah. is not one of them. Um, yeah. I, I, I don't believe in it. I don't do it. Um, but um, to me with, you, you know, you want your lawyer, hopefully to have some friendship to a certain extent with mm-hmm. the other side. In fact, one of the things I do whenever I get a case, regardless of who it is, I call and I pick up the phone or I pick up the phone and I call the other side and I say, hey, here's what I understand about the facts of the case. Mm. What do you understand about the facts of the case? What do you think the parties agree on? What right. do you think the parties don't agree on? And let's see if we can if we can get a writing down and, and, and agree to settle those things that we agree on. And then we can, we can focus on what needs to be fought. Right. Interesting. Everybody wins in that. And I believe that the faster I can close the case out, the yeah. sooner I'll get two more cases in typically right. is what happens. Yeah. So, and then you, you're more inclined to refer a client to me yes. because I, I did it, you know, economically, efficiently and effectively. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. I think referrals um, are definitely the way that most people do and should hire attorneys. Unfortunately, they don't. A lot of them do go through advertising. Really? Um, I, uh, yeah. I mean, otherwise... Google, Facebook, all those resources mm. would be out there. Um, mm. But I do believe that you should be getting a referral from word of mouth. Hopefully somebody who's used that lawyer, whoever it right. is. Right, exactly. Um, that I think is vitally important because mm-hmm. uh, they have the experience. Uh, right. Anybody put anything on Facebook, you can even buy leads, you can buy commentary on, on these things, which bothers me. Um, so uh, you know, I saw a lawyer not in this town who had a website. He'd been out six months and had a hundred and something reviews. Right. He could have had a hundred and something clients in six months. Yeah. Let alone close those cases. Right. So that, that bothered me somewhat. So, yeah. um, you know, be careful of the advertising that's out there. Mm. Ask people. If not, your local bar association sometimes will make referrals. They're not always the best. But right. typically, you're at, you, and if you have a CPA, if you have a doc, if you have a, if you know professionals, other doctors, other investment advisors, people like that, they know lawyers who they've dealt with or had clients who've dealt with other lawyers, mm. and they are a good source of referrals. Yeah. But a lot of people are afraid to ask somebody because that means they got to tell somebody, hey, here's what's um, going on in my life. Right, right. I, don't, okay. you know, I, I want, it's going to crush my image that I have the perfect life. Right. And, and it's okay to go through this process. And Absolutely. It's better, for, it's better for children. I mean, yeah. if, you're, if the two of you are not getting along in a house with children, you're, and you don't get divorced, you're just teaching them to stay in an environment that's bad. It's Unhealthy. Just right. Yeah. It's stressful for you and the kids. I would, you know, I believe the kids grow up in that space between the parents. And if it's unhealthy and stoic and there's no affection, like, that's what the kids are growing up in. And that's what they are seeing as uh, a healthy marriage or assuming that's what marriage should look like. And yeah. That's- Listen, one of the best couples I've ever worked with or client I've ever worked with to do co-parenting is you. I mean, <laughs> thank it, you. It, it, you should be applauded a hundredfold. You should teach how to co-parent. Yeah. I mean, I do work with my clients on that, but yeah. And my thing with that is choose your battles, really, really choose your battles and um, recognize that you split for a reason, but that doesn't mean that you can't uh, actually work together as a team. I always, we agreed when we split that we were just going to be a family with a different shape at And that's really what we are. And we still um, do holidays together and get along at kids' events. Uh, The one thing I will say is we're both rational people. We have our moments that we disagree. But overall, and I think it's very difficult for people if they're dealing with an ex who is, you know, mentally unwell or it's you know, the situation, I'm lucky that we are both rational people who can communicate through challenges. But Absolutely. And you know who wins in that, right? The children. 
the children. Absolutely. I, I, you know, I've never seen, you know, I've never seen a situation where that doesn't benefit the children. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That was my main, like anytime, like there was a battle, I was like, should I bring this up or address this? And usually a lot of the time it was like, nope, it's not going to change anything. And I don't need to make waves because for the most part, everything is going somewhat smoothly. Um, and, you know, in the beginning there, I know that, uh, I know that my ex kind of felt like, uh, yeah, he got screwed in mediation. And I think partly that was because- I'll take that as a compliment. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, I think he wasn't well prepared for mediation because his lawyer set him up to believe that, you know, there would be no alimony and which was just absurd with our situation. And so he wasn't well prepared. And I had done a ton of research and soul searching and came in with my binder. So I was like really confident and knew what I thought made sense and was fair for our situation. And so, you know, I know right after the divorce, he was angry and there was a period where we weren't very, we didn't communicate a lot or interact that much, but time you heals. Yeah. And, um, you know, things kind of settle into place and you just have to recognize it, it does take time because the divorce is stressful. Um, for people who are just starting out and they're trying, they don't want to break the bank and they're trying to decide like, should I hire an attorney with a retainer? Should I try and do it an attorney by the hour? Uh, should I try and get a mediator and see how far we can get with a mediator without hiring attorneys? Like what are the different approaches? It, it all, it, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but it yeah, all depends ahead. on the facts of the case. Yeah, okay. It really does. I mean, if it's a short-term marriage, it's a year and a half long, two years long, let's say, and you both make somewhat similar monies and all you did was buy a house together, you know, maybe get a consult or two and, and you mm -hmm. should be able to figure it out yourselves. Right, okay. Um, I would hope, you know, but then again, mm -hmm. there's people mm -hmm. who, you know, if you started a business together and you had a kid and it's still a two-year marriage, Okay, and you can't agree on time sharing and you think your spouse is a drug addict. Okay, that's not a simple case. Yeah. So you can't just say, okay, anything under two years, you do it on your own. Anything over two years, right. you do it with an attorney. You know, it's very, very, very fact specific. I always say I don't practice McDonald's. Anymore. You can't come into me and say, I'll take number one. I don't have a board that says, I'll take number one, but supersize it. Right. You know, it's not that option. Yeah. Um, you know, I try to break it. I, try to use a three-tier pricing approach as far as my retainer goes. My okay. hourly rate is still the same. Um, yeah. and, and it's not how much money you have. I mean, there right. are lawyers who do that, and that's bad lawyering. Yeah. Uh, that's, that, that's a lawyer who you should run, run from. Mm -hmm. um, because just because you have money doesn't mean it's a big retainer. And right. just because you don't have money doesn't mean it's a cheap retainer. Yeah. And, it, you know, it, and, and listen to what your attorney is telling you is realistic. Yeah, you know, I, had, I had a lawyer, I had a client come in one time, it's about five years ago, and the, the client came in, the client was making well in excess of a half a million dollars a year, and it had been a 27-year marriage, and there was essentially no assets. These people had lived on every dollar they made, kids in private school, four cars, mm -hmm. the boat, the beach house, the house, right. things like that. Okay. And the there was no money to go around other than his income. There was no 401. There was very little 401k and very little money in your house. Okay. And so the client came to me and came in for second cons, second second opinion. He had met with another lawyer, and he said, "Look, I met with this after my consult. He met with his. He goes, I've met with another lawyer. He said I don't have to pay. Any, he, he didn't think I'd have to pay any alimony. I said, not only do I think that's wrong, I'll guarantee you you're going to pay alimony. Mm -hmm. I said, God Himself's not going to get you out of this one." <laughs> um, and so, I, and I said, here's what you should do. And I go, then why'd you come to me? He said, well, that lawyer wanted a $25,000 retainer. You only want a $10,000 retainer. I said, I'd go back and tell, this is what I told him. I said, I'd go back to the other lawyer. Tell him if he puts it in writing that he guarantees no alimony, you'll pay him $250,000. <laughs> right. And, so 
And he's like, well, I thought something was up. I'm telling you it's up. I, you you yeah. can't do it. I go, he was trying to get your retainer money. And that's not going to happen. Right. Um, you know, you got to be concerned about that stuff. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, think about it logically. I mean, thank God that client was astute enough that he recognized that was an implausible outcome. Yeah, and absolutely. And yeah. I mean, you wind up representing them and doing a good job for them and whatnot. But, you know, you've got to be realistic. You know, I can't win every case, but depending on what the fact pattern is. But the question is, is how much better can I do for your loss? Right. I mean, you're going to pay alimony. The question now right. in that case was, how much less can I get it than what they want? Right. Yes, that's, exactly. That's, a win. that's the win. And I think that what you said, like, realistically, what that guy was promising is just absurd. If it sounds too good to be true. It, it is. probably is too good to be true. Like, and uh, so using your wits is a, a big part of. Common um, sense. Common yeah. Sense. Yeah. You know, but at the same time, if you came to me and your spouse makes $2 million a year, you don't have any, any savings. And you say, listen, my spouse is offering me $2,000 a month. And I say, you should take it. You should probably get a second opinion. Mm -hmm. you know so right. you're right common sense is important um you know depending on the uh, you know also depending on who your referral source is uh, mm -hmm. you know thankfully a lot of people get more than one referral from you know when they come to see me they're like oh hey so and so referred me and so and so and right. so if you feel comfortable with me that should be good or whoever you go to if you've got yeah. two or three people that used that person mm -hmm. then, you, then and you feel comfortable when you met them that should be enough i wouldn't go out and try and interview 20 lawyers yeah. Then, then you're not going to know where you're going and then you're going to just be worse off than you were if you would have just picked two or three. Yeah, absolutely. And how important do you feel is having like an easy rapport with the lawyer? Well, like I said earlier, the, the, the better the rapport, the more economically advantageous to the parties it is. And more likely than not, the chances are it's going to resolve itself without the need of litigation, when I say litigation, without the need of hearings or trials. Right. Okay. So one other question when it comes to like people who want to try and uh, use like a mediator first without hiring attorneys, do you ever take that settlement, let's say they get to a decent settlement with a mediator and then bring it to lawyer, each bring it to their own lawyer and have the lawyer review it? Or is that kind of... I don't like that when they come to me for that I'll, I'll just be honest with you yeah because invariably when they come to me i don't have enough documentation yeah for me to guess mm -hmm. so if you bring me a settlement agreement and say hey is this good he's willing to pay me ten thousand dollars a month in alimony right i can't tell you if that's good or not because i don't have a w-2 a tax return i don't have a financial affidavit i don't know if he owns part of the stock part of the business have we had the business value I don't know if your if your spouse works overseas and doesn't pay taxes. That's another issue. I mean, is, is your spouse about to go? You know, granted, your spouse might be making one hundred thousand dollars now, but your spouse is set to get a raise and become a part owner, and maybe make five hundred thousand dollars a year. Right. Well, that ability. You know, I need to know all the facts. Yeah. And without that, looking at a piece of paper, I mean, I, I'm 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 merely guessing. Yeah. Okay. And I'm not saying we have to litigate everything. I'm saying come to me, bring me everything. Yes. Once again, it goes back to the first thing we talked about. It's information. Information. Yeah. Information's power. Um, yeah. So uh, uh, one of the things I wanted to, I was just thinking and I've forgotten. Hold on. Um, oh, so for clients who are um, coming to you and emailing you like every day with another question. Like one of the things that I, in my training, we were trained to help people organize their thoughts and yes. organize their questions and consolidate so that they maybe set up one meeting to talk with the attorney and they have everything organized versus the one-off email every other day. First of all, you're going to save yourself a ton of money. Yeah, that's Secondly, why I try to help. A ton of money. I tell people the worst thing you can do is constantly email me. If you want to email me and say, hey, are we still meeting today at three o'clock? That's an email. Yeah. But hey, I, 
my my spouse and I were talking last night, and I think that I'm going to accept this for alimony and this for time sharing. What do you think? Right. No. Yeah. yeah. That's called get on my calendar. Let's talk. That's yeah. not a, a, an email because no matter what I email, you're coming back. Right. Well, well, I appreciate that, but I'm thinking this, or this is another. No, it's yeah. cheaper and easier to talk mm -hmm. than um, it is to email. Right. It's going to be faster. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you don't want me going point one to send you an email, point one to review it, then this, da, 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 da. Next thing you know, you spent two hours emailing today. Something right. that would have been handled in a 15-minute phone call. Yeah. So do you recommend if they have a question about something like the alimony discussed is to call the paralegal or email no. the paralegal and say no? Not the paralegal. Well, call the paralegal or the receptionist. To like, set up a time. Get, right. You. I have a scheduling assistant. Right. You, yeah. you call and get on my books. Right. Yeah. And okay. then we sit down and then you have my undivided attention. Right. And I have your case in front of me and mm. whether it's on a computer or the physical file or both. And I can sit there and say, okay, well, let me go back and look at your spouse's tax return or your spouse's this. And I, I can assess all that. Right. That's, that's a thing. That, that yeah. makes the most sense. And then the other thing in my training, they talked about how, you know, as a divorce coach, we can be there to support the emotional aspect and the stress rather than having people lean on their attorneys whose hourly rate is hundred percent what a hundred percent yeah hundred percent i always tell people look deal with a deal with you as a coach deal with your counselor anybody else is going to be cheaper if you're talking about it from the emotional aspect unfortunately the law is not emotional yeah yeah and so if you want to deal with the emotional part of it there's cheaper avenues to do it and there's more readily accessible avenues to do that right Right. And so, and, and by the way, you can't, there's, you know, in, at least in Florida, you want attorney's fees, you don't necessarily get attorney's fees just for handle. Mm. So unless it's productive in, 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 in the case, just calling to talk once a week is not compensable in, in that regard. So you want mm. to be pointed in your conversations with your attorney. Mm -hmm. Hey, here's what I'm thinking. Right. And let's talk about that. Yeah. Let's talk about the, the facts. Mm -hmm. Dealing with the emotions, I'll listen to you, but I'll be honest with you, uh, you know, us lawyers, while we, we're called attorneys and counselors, mm -hmm. we really aren't the counselor part. Right, right. And I know of one, count, one attorney in town who, who's got an, uh, a, a, a background in, in, in mental health. Right. But, uh, there may be more, I just don't know. But Sure. That, you know, why pay the hourly rate? And secondly, yeah. you want to separate that from 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 the value of your lawyer representing you mm -hmm. Absolutely. i mean I, I i mean i would love your kids and i do love your kids but um uh, you want me to be focused on getting you the relief and the remedies you want mm -hmm. and not focused on taking on the psychological part of what's right going on. right handling that's, detract that's from my not ability. lawyering right that's yeah. going to detract from my ability to do what I wanted, what, what you want me to do. Right. Absolutely. Um, uh, oh, this is a question that one of my uh, one of my clients was just asking uh, is if inheritance is comes in during a marriage, is that a marital asset or. That's a great question. The answer is it depends. <laughs> OK, yeah. I thought okay. I heard something like that was a little. You need to, if you if you're going to receive an inheritance, it needs to be received by it received into a. I I prefer, and I always tell my clients, a new account only in your name, that mm. is never commingled. Gotcha. Leave it alone. If it's left alone. You have the argument that it has not been commingled. It was received as a gift or an inheritance. It is not subject to the court's equitable distribution authority. Okay. Jurisdiction. Right. So that's the key. Okay. But um, if you get it and you put it into your joint bank account, then you've muddied the waters. And I'm not going to say it's 100%. There's cases that go both ways. It depends on how long it was there, how often it was 
commingled, how many checks went in, how many checks went out, how many years has it been, things of that nature. Right. Okay. Then it becomes very muddy. Okay, gotcha. That's good information to have. Right. Um, I always say check with your lawyer or, or talk to a family lawyer before you're going to do anything if you're going to put it into a separate, if you're not going to put it in a separate account, be very cautious. Yeah, okay. That's uh, good information for just my knowledge. Um, last question. Sure. Uh, what are your thoughts on, like there was a lot of trending towards like people talking about collaborative divorce versus traditional divorce, both uses lawyers, but what is your take on collaborative versus not collaborative approach? Very, very case specific. Oh, okay. Very, very fact specific. Mm -hmm. um, in my opinion, not every case is a collaborative case. If ever, there are lawyers in town who only prefer to do collaborative. Right. And there are lawyers who only prefer to do litigation. I don't agree with either. Okay. okay? I think a happy medium is where you should be. Right. So it depends on what you want. So I have done collaborative cases, done a few where this, the same concept fact pattern was around where the husband and wife or uh, both parties, um, depending on the genders, um, they have, they own a business together. Okay. And let's say it's a transportation business, a medical business, medical manufacturing business, um, things of that nature. I even have one with a franchise. Mm. Both parties are integral in the success of that business. Okay. Yeah. More likely than not, the case law suggests that if the court, if you bring the business to the court, the court has to elect who's going to get the business and who's going to get the half the value of the business. Okay. But sometimes, and I did this one in a transportation company years ago, whereby both parties were heavily needed. One worked the inside of the business and one worked the outside of the business. Mm -hmm. Okay, my client was dealing with the outside. Both parties unequivocally agree that they both need to be business partners going forward. Okay. He needed her, she needed him. Right. And they were going to make, a, they made a lot of money. And they yeah. made a lot more money together than they were ever going to make apart. Sure. And whoever got the money, if they if they went to court, somebody was going to get the business and somebody else was going to get cash and they were going to open up their own business and compete. Right. That would have that, that yeah. been the worst thing they could have done was competing against each other. Right. It would right. have been successful and it would have been financially, you would have been dissipating. Mm -hmm. So that was a perfect collaborative case because we we did it because the remedy that we needed was available. Mm. A lot of times I represent physicians or professionals where they need to do a collaborative because of their schedules. Mm. You know, mm. I can do, I, I've, I've represented physicians where we've done every collaborative meeting after five o'clock at night. Okay. Now you gotta make sure the attorney on the other side and the neutral professionals can, can are willing to work at night. Right, I see. So, you know, I, I did one where both sides were attorneys. And everybody was in agreement. They didn't want to do it nine to five. Mm. And so we did that after hours a lot. I've done a couple of doctors at night, things of that nature. It doesn't have to just be a professional. It can be anybody of that nature. Sure. Or third, nobody wants, you know, sometimes you, you there's, there's reasons why you want privacy. Mm. And in a collaborative case, everything is done privately. It's not being published. You're not filing stuff. And so nobody knows. Uh, know your business. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, that makes a so lot of sense. That can be a huge benefit to the parties. Right, right. And it's not yeah. necessarily a lot of money. A lot of times it's accusations of, mm -hmm. of criminal activity, things of that nature. You don't need that. Right, right. So every case, and, and you know, you have to understand collaborative cases, while they may save a lot of money in the, at the end, if it, depending on what the type of case is, there's still a burden and it's a little higher than the average case to get started. Right. Because you're hiring two more professionals. Yeah. You're hiring a mental health professional and you're hiring a financial professional mm -hmm. that are both neutral. So you've already got an added cost. Yes, for sure. So, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't do it because a lot of times that's cheaper than mm -hmm. if we litigate. I mean, I've got one where we needed a financial expert right now in the case. It's not a collaborative case, but we realized that we just needed one financial person. We agreed to each share the same expert. Mm, without okay. prejudice right 
because uh, that, that person could be neutral. Right. Yeah. And, and we hired that we hired that expert and we're doing it that way. Yeah. Whereas it would be that way in a collaborative case, the, 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 the experts are, are neutral, but it's the added expense right off the bat, not when right. you need them. Yes, that makes a lot of sense. So, um, you know, just, you know, people come into me all the time and they say, oh, is this good for collaborative? Or I definitely don't want collaborative. And I tell them why, or I tell them why they shouldn't. Yeah. So it's not, I, 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 you know, I'm not going to lie to you. The majority of my cases are in litigation, mm-hmm. but there, there are benefits. There are benefits to collaborative cases. Right. Okay. But also so you, have I didn't... Collaborative, you have to be collaboratively minded in, as far as both parties go is what I mean. And getting back to information, if your spouse isn't willing to give voluntarily give the information, mm-hmm. then you shouldn't even be going into collaborative. Yeah. Okay. Because collaborative is probably going to fall you... apart. Right. Yeah. And so when you say collaborative versus litigation, in my head, litigation means you're going to court. Litigation, what I'm understanding is just two court. attorneys and could end in mediation or could litigate in court. Correct. Correct. Okay. Okay. Because I always call it collaborative versus traditional because I wasn't sure what the... I but, use collaborative versus litigation. You call it collaborative versus traditional. I mean, you know, collaborative is still, it's still, it's still a very new word. And so the nomenclature can be anything you want it to be. Right. Um, and okay. things of that nature. But yes, there's yeah. definitely um, there's definitely two different approaches, but also you have to look at who the attorney is on the other side. Yeah. You know, there's plenty of people who say they're collaborative, mm. but I wouldn't bet on it. And I got to be honest with you, sometimes I get into a collaborative case and I go, wow, I'm just, I'm not the collaborative attorney for this. Or, you know, what right. I really like, I really believe this one should be collaborative. Yeah. Okay. Because sometimes, I, sometimes I'll find out information. I did one years ago and uh, without getting into the facts of it, because it would be this, it would be disclosed. But uh, I learned some facts that were astonishing to me, and um, it was very good that we were in collaborative, because that would have been an embarrassment to the family and to the, the the person paying the alimony would have been economically destroyed if those facts had not been. Wow! Oh, interesting. So that case needed to stay collaborative. Yeah. And I wonder if that person realized up front going into collaborative or they just got lucky that they chose collaborative when that. They got lucky that they chose the attorneys who recommended collaborative. Oh. Because I'll be you, this was so new into collaborative times uh, uh, that we got into this. In fact, right. it was maybe my, it was one of my first 10 and it was probably the, and I know it was the other side uh, first. Oh, wow. So, and it was a benefit to the to the parties without. Yeah. A OK, yeah, that's really interesting with that fact about the privacy. Um, one more question I thought. Sure. Was, OK, so how do attorneys choose the mediator that they agree like you and my ex's attorney chose Amy Goodblatt and she ended yeah. up being a wonderful mediator for us. And I felt like helps the so we, process. How do I look at it? I get the attorney on the other side to hopefully pick up the phone. A lot don't, I'll be honest with you. But I try and get on the phone and say, okay, who has the more difficult client? Okay. <laughs> and then I'll say, okay, if my client's more difficult, here's why my client's more difficult. Uh-huh. And what person is going to facilitate my client's personality the best? Is it somebody older? Is it somebody uh-huh. younger? Is it somebody of the male sex or the female sex? Mm. Is it somebody who only mediates or somebody who mediates and practices law? It depends on, it depends on, to me, it depends on those facts. I think lawyers, a lot of times, you who's whoever they like. And don't get me wrong, I have preferences of who I like. Of course. Yeah. But at the same time, if, if the, uh, if my client needs a special type of mediator or the other side needs a special type of mediator, then let's accommodate that because that's going to reach the resolution for the parties. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm not just going to pick my friend because I like my friend. I mean, I want to get the case settled. Yeah. I, once again, I don't advertise. So I've got to get you settled mm-hmm. to get you recommending me. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, a case ending fast and smooth is definitely the best case scenario for a client to refer their Absolutely. divorce attorney. Um, 
once it gets dragged out, like that, the question is why? And sometimes it's, you know, obviously uh, if the X on the other side is difficult or the other lawyer is difficult, you don't have full control. But uh, I guess a good attorney who's been around a long time knows how to work with difficult lawyers on the other end as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So, okay, Damon, thank you so much. This was great. Thank, thank you for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I will be in touch just to uh, let you know when this is up on YouTube. And I just really appreciate your time. Happy holidays. And we'll chat soon. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Take bye -bye. care. Bye.